Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am here with Martin Eor Willis. Eor, oh my God, I just realized something. What? I remind you of Eor. Well, just wow. today, because you said you're 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 kind of tired, and when we yes. were talking just a minute ago, because we're both kind of tired, I literally just got back from Roswell. Um, uh, I think that we both found like may sound a little bit like a couple of Eeyores just kind of, Oh dear. We're going to talk oh. about UFOs today. <laughs> oh me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we can do it though. We're going to yes. get through this. We're going to do it. And, and especially cause the topics are so exciting. Uh, I am charged up in that, uh, the Roswell event went great. Everything was cool there. So that was a lot of fun. I bet they missed uh, Stan Freeman. He was always there, wasn't he? For of years. Of course, yes. It was very sad, you know, and I'll admit this because I'm a, I'm a kind of a forward thinking progressive man. But uh, during the panel, I was actually moderating the big Roswell panels uh, on Friday or no, Saturday and Sundays, which all the, with all the Roswell researchers. And at the end of the last one, uh, yesterday, I, I, you know, wanted to end with a moment of silence and said a couple things about Stan. And I got really emotional, actually, uh, which yeah. was surprising. I, I, I didn't, it. you know, just break down sobbing and bawling, uh, you know, on the floor or something. But uh, it was it was a get it was really hard to get out some of the words. And uh, I mm-hmm. mean, on the one hand, I was surprised I got so emotional. On the second hand, you know, a year prior in that very room, we were doing a panel and it was we all you know, knew this would be Stanton's last uh, panel. Not because uh, he, we we thought it would be this way. It's because he said he was going to retire and not come back to Roswell. That's right. So soon after he did say he was going to come back to Roswell, but of course he didn't make it back. But uh, all I could think of is, you know, at the end, the standing ovation we gave him because it was going to be it. And uh, what a, what a moment that was. And that turned out to be, you know, his last panel at Roswell. And, um, yeah, he was a very yeah. important, a, a great person. Yeah, yeah. I remember always uh, hearing that he hearing that he was out there every single year, every every year since I've known of him and the Roswell thing. He he is gone. I mean, has yeah. he? How many years in a row did he ever miss a year going there? Uh, Fifty five years in a row. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that actually, the fiftieth anniversary, I think, is when the festival started. Uh, nineteen ninety seven. It mm-hmm. was huge. I mean, it was in Time Magazine. It was a big, big deal. Lots of news about it in ninety seven, and uh, it was so big, and there's so many people that it started the annual event, which is always huge. I, I live streamed, and I did it over Instagram, and I shouldn't have because Instagram, and, and this is definitely an Instagram complaint. You can only, unless I don't know what I'm doing, when you do a live stream um, and, and share it to your story, it'll only display for an hour or a day, and then it's gone. So this great video I did of uh, oh. you know live streaming the parade while I'm on a float is now lost. <laughs> My God, that's so that strange. Sad? Yeah, it's just like vanished. Mm-hmm. So, wow. uh, but there were a lot of people. It was a lot of fun. Um, so uh, and lots of great talks and it's always good to see some friends and everything so oh yeah and you know we're going to get into the news in a second and and the guest here and actually talk about what we're here to talk about but um the paper the paper loves me there of course i write for them occasionally and they asked me to write something up for them so i did and they posted that on uh or they printed it on the print paper and put it online on saturday But they also had uh, one of my talks on the front page. They covered both of my talks at the event uh, 
in the paper. So like Saturday's paper with me on the front page and then uh, about a story about my talk and then my story in there, it was like a, a Rojas edition of the Roswell Daily Record. So honored. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I remember last year you had something to do with that too. I yeah, I think it was telling... similar. I was in there mm-hmm. and I might have, ri- I probably did write something for them. Um, so, and I might try to do that more regularly. They said they'd like that. So yeah, that was really cool. Oh, this is cool too. Um, I want to start, I want to say, you know, shout out to, to 98.7 in California. My sister texted me and I guess one of their interns went to Roswell and, uh, they asked her about that. And, uh, then some of the DJs, including, uh, this guy, Woody, we're like, hey, oh yeah, I listened to Alejandro Rojas. He was out there, and he's got a great podcast. So I'm not sure if they mentioned you, Martin, but I'm sure they love you too. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, to any of you guys listening, 98.7, thanks, dudes. It's out of wow. LA. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. How cool is that's that, great, dude. You're getting coverage. Awesome wow. stuff. So yeah. Speaking of awesome stuff, we have a remarkable guest today. I'm so excited about this guest and our conversation. I think it clears up a lot of misperceptions people have about information and vetting, you know, uh, information. Uh, Our guest today is uh, Brian Bender. So you probably saw him on Unidentified, the History Channel show. Uh, He also... Politico. Yeah, exactly. He's with Politico. He is the defense editor. Um... And he's the guy on Politico who's written about UFO stories. He's broken some news. So, for instance, he was the guy originally in 2017. He had confirmed with uh, the DOD that Lou Elizondo did work for ATIP. Uh, later on, more recently, he broke the story about the Navy creating new UFO guidelines. Uh, what was another story? There was another one. Oh, uh, Senator Warren speaking about UFOs and saying that, yes, we were briefed on UFOs. Uh, He broke that story. Of course, now we have another senator uh, who's spoken about seeing UFOs and then and someone else that's very high in the government. The president, of course, uh, it's about as high as you can get, has been talking about being briefed on UFOs. So, yeah, so really cool stuff. Uh, So he's going to be on. That's that's a good get. Yeah. yeah, he also worked for the Boston Globe and Jane's Defense Weekly, which is a, a defense magazine, Jane's Defense, very popular, well-known. But the Boston Globe, he did a ton of war correspondence uh, mm. back in the day. In fact, he's even got a book out where this Iraqi veteran um, had gone looking for this World War II fighter pilot, uh, you know, what had happened to him, looking for his remains in New Guinea. And he's got a book out on that. So he's also a member of the, um, a board member of the Military Reporters and Editors Association. And this is all very important because uh, I think it's really important to establish his credibility and his experience because some of the goofball UFO people out there have been doubting him, um, accusing him of some really ridiculous kind of stuff, I think. Uh, and and so this is great because mm. we get a chance to talk to him. I mean, uh, some people have assumed like somehow that he's in cahoots with uh, Elizondo and, and To the Stars. And he's not at all. He's very independent. His parts were filmed separately. Uh, he, he's totally independent. Actually, I've got to have lunch and dinner with him lately because he lives here locally. And uh, that's how I got this interview. He is actually in the studio right here uh, for wow. the interview. But... Um, yeah, he, he really, he's interested in this topic, uh, but he is not like, you know, he doesn't, like, he doesn't have a dog in the race, essentially. He's just covering the news and the story and letting them unfold and covering it like he would any uh, defense yeah. story. And this is a defense story, of course, because it's the DOD that uh, Lou Elizondo worked for. So Probably I, healthy skepticism. Right, and, exactly. And uh, he, he strikes me as someone highly intelligent and uh, very well-spoken. I, I'm really excited to listen to the interview. Yes, a great interview. So very excited to have him. And I think the listeners are going to particularly enjoy this one because I, I think it does clear up a lot of things. Like, uh, for instance, you know, how you go about reporting information, especially 
when FOIA is kind of a waste of time. FOIA is not the primary place you go, the Freedom of Information Act, to get information as a reporter, especially one as seasoned as Mr. Bender is. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yes, but before that, uh, just a quick intro. This is uh, at Open Mind UFO Radio. We do cover uh, the UFO phenomena in a more journalistic, serious manner. We're looking at, you know, more of the credible, substantiated information. If it is speculation, so for example, we had a lot of speculation in our last show, but we'll let you know that, and we'll let you know what is hard evidence and what is not, you know, what is credible or what... um, is a little more dubious or perhaps just uh, isn't as substantiated uh, as other things. And and until lately, a lot of the UFO field was more uh, speculative. But now we have a lot of hard mm-hmm. information coming out. So, in fact, you know, the first thing I, I want to kind of introduce the first topic in the news, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I, just because I would like to get your thoughts on the last episode of Unidentified, uh, the, this History Channel show that was covering To the Stars, which is a, a lot of former government officials and one rock star, uh, and it includes Luis Elizondo, uh-huh. who worked for the Pentagon program and their ongoing investigation of UFOs, and the season finale was just the other night. It was, and it's the first show that I actually watched live. I usually catch them, you know, by going... Um, you know, on cable and, uh, you know, spectrum and all that going in through that way. But I watched it live. And uh, these days, I, I forget personally... that's even possible. I, I watch everything <laughs> on streaming. And sometimes, uh, yeah, you know, I Karen know. mentioned once in a while, well, maybe we could watch it live. I think it's on right now. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a eh, thing. Why bother? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, I thought it was great. I was really I was really happy with uh, the show overall. And um, you know, they're alluding that there's going to be another season, but um, do you happen to know? I mean, usually they know by this time whether it's uh, going to be in for another season. Do you well, happen to I'll know that? I'll say I don't know for sure, um, mm-hmm. but it is looking like there is going to be a second season. I mean, it, 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 things are looking positive, and at least the rumors on the street, not that I've heard anything official at all, but it is looking like yeah. they will have a second season, and we'll definitely let you all know when we find out. Because we'll probably find out first because we're just that cool. (laughs) Well, I like, you know, at the very ending, it it sort of left a little bit of a left you hanging just a little bit to make you think that they were probably going to be coming back. Mm -hmm. Um, I I really liked um, when they went to Italy and uh, they spoke with, you know, there was that one personality that spoke um, in English um, and, you know, really put Lou on the spot. you know, as far as uh, trying to get him to reveal classified information, of course he didn't. But uh, you know, uh, but anyway, I thought uh, the encounter was pretty amazing, and they have photographs of it. They showed of this object behind this helicopter, and supposedly shot a. Well, I don't know how much I should talk about this. A uh, spoiler for someone who hasn't watched it yet. Yeah, it is a bit but, of a uh, spoiler. But you know what isn't a spoiler is. is this is funny. Is that I don't know if you've noticed this, but there were a lot of people online, uh, and I think someone had asked me, oh no, someone found a story I wrote about these uh, orbs of light that were coming out of the ocean and essentially terrorizing this uh, town in Italy. And, uh, you know, they asked me, is this what, because Tom DeLonge had hinted that there would be an Italian um, Mm -hmm. case like you just described with a helicopter. And a lot of people, somebody asked me, tweeted me, is this the case that's going to be on the show? And I said, I don't know. But Mm. people went wild with assuming that it was. They're like, this is it. This is the case that's going to be on the show. Alejandro wrote a story about it. So, (laughs) And actually, it is uh, essentially. So there were these mysterious fires that were started by these orbs that were coming out of the ocean. And it is, that's what the helicopter was going to investigate. In the show, they say this helicopter was going to go investigate these this UO, UAP phenomena that was happening in this uh, area called uh, Canetto di Cora, Coronia. And, um, yeah, so this helicopter was involved with that case. So, you guys called it. Wow, yeah. 
Yeah, that's what the helicopter was there out there researching. I was checking right. it out. What was going on when yeah. that when that happened? Crazy, stuff, which is huh? yeah, that was really good. So yeah. it was really good. I also liked that they covered a little bit of lose motivations. You know, there was some more skepticism, like you know, why are you doing this? Uh, what's going on here? Uh, and and I, you know, some people might see that as disingenuous, but. Uh, uh, Anthony LePay, at least from my conversations, and perhaps you got this sense too. He he, I think was taking a, a trying to take and and I think intending to take a more unbiased look at this and to kind of grill these guys, you know, to to make mm-hmm. sure everything's on the up and up. And it was also interesting that uh, you know, according to Lou, uh, well, we know the program's going on, but uh, and, but this is something that Bender and I and I should say. The interview that you're going to hear with Bender and I was before that episode came out, so neither of us had seen it, um, hmm. even though Bender's mm-hmm. in it. But uh, this whole thing about people in the inside being upset with him, and I, and that, which is true, and you know, Bender and I talk about that a bit, and and oh, yeah. this goes to this. You know, I keep asking people involved with all of this do you think that there's some bigger conspiracy that you're part of some agenda to get ufo information out and they've all said no but there's this major assumption by the ufo community and others that that is what's going on and just from my perspective having been involved with all of these people for literally decades that just does not seem to be the case. These people are very independent of the government and many of these other people in the government. And I think that people are upset with Lou, and they genuinely are, uh, demonstrates that. Um, you know, this isn't some concerted effort of an organized group. This is, uh, you know, people interested who have been fighting for uh, more paranormal type of topics to get taken seriously and be investigated inside the government and they're finally after all of these years essentially robert bigelow this billionaire and his buddies out of las vegas they're finally really gaining some ground and and making some big headway with the help of uh, government insiders like chris mellon and lou elizondo now what makes the people on the inside, angry at him um, because it doesn't make their job any tougher, does it? Or oh, does are you it? kidding? Of course it does. Because now... For, for funding? No. For, uh, for years, they have claimed, up until 2007 or 2017, before the New York Times article came out, that they had nothing to do or no interest in UFOs. Now Elizondo has revealed that that was false. That was just straight up false. I see. And that they've they've had a program since 2007 and that this program continues. They don't want to talk about this stuff, you know. And so that's why they're put in a strange position. That's why we're getting these really strange responses, I think. But uh, I won't get more into it because Brian and I uh, talk about this quite a bit in the interview. Okay, yeah. I'll be uh, interested to hear more about it. Yeah, so you can hear his perspective. Mm-hmm. Because he has a Great. more educated perspective on, on you know, because uh, he's been working with uh, these agencies for so long. And, and there's some really interesting uh, revelations that he, he gave to me that, that are pertinent to this discussion. But uh, what news did you want to discuss, my friend? Uh, well, I wanted to talk, you were talking about a uh, briefing, you mentioned that. And and I want to talk. I know I did. I believe I talked about this last time about Trump's opinion on UFOs. But again, uh, this was uh, uh, this is actually on Fox News. And this Tucker Carlson is actually really um, pretty aggressive um, about this UFO he, yeah. topic. As far as um, you know, the mainstream news media. I mean, I would say that I, he's probably one of the most aggressive people talking about it out there and he actually asked the president point blank during an interview about about ufos and he persisted and uh you know just like uh, if you watch there's a video up on fox and if you watch that video nick pope um also speaks with tucker later and after he views the interview and makes a very good point you know here we are on the record uh president of the united states actually talking about ufos on the record in an interview um, you know, and he also says, you know, that he he doesn't, you know, I think he says the word something like I that? personally don't. Uh, um, Trump says he personally tends to doubt it. 
we right. know that UFOs exist, mm. that type of thing. But um, but he does says uh, I'm not a believer, but uh, you know anything is possible. Now uh, Nick Pope makes a good point. He says you know of course he's uh, you know first learning about something he's treating it with skepticism and you know who who wouldn't you know that that type of thing. But also I do want to point out um, you know when I spoke with Chris Mellon a few years ago. He said that, um, you know, if any if the president wanted to know something, if, if someone knew something, they had to tell him. But there's also, you know, co- compartmentalized um, situations where and need to knows and uh, private, uh, you, you know, uh, um, things can be put in the private sector um, information. Um, it, it all boils down to the fact that I've said many times, you've heard me say it, that, you know, and, and you I think you agree with me that, you know, maybe the government only knows so much about what's going on and not not uh, everything like a lot of people accuse them, you know, of knowing like exactly what's going yeah, on. I mean, it's been and, entirely possible. Robert Bigos is the only billionaire we know dumping tons of money into this UFO topic. Uh, people mm-hmm. may not realize there was a Rockefeller. Lawrence Rockefeller uh, put a lot of money into researching all of this as well. Right. Uh, he's passed mm-hmm. away. But uh, both of them found have found kind of similar things, which is not much. And mm. uh, uh, Bigelow, of course, has said in the past that he knows aliens are here and they're walking among us. I don't, I don't know what he feels justifies that. Uh, if it's information that they feel they obtain themselves, I that would be my guess. I think that's what he means. Uh, he could mean that he he knows there's information inside the government, but I've never heard him say anything like that. However, his uh, investigations with his guys have revealed some pretty interesting things. So I think that's what he means. So I would agree with you. I think yeah. that the, the president uh, and, you know, it was first of all, we heard him say last time that he only had a short briefing, a short meeting. That's right. In fact, he mm-hmm. called it a brief meeting. He didn't even call it a briefing. It was a brief meeting. <laughs> Uh, This time, like you said, Tucker pressed him on it. And one of the points Tucker pressed him on was the same point that I pressed Lou Elizondo on, uh, which he told Tucker Tucker that he believed. And he said, I don't I can't say I know this, but it is my opinion that the government does have materials from a UFO. Uh, And Tucker did push the president, uh, you know, what this guy is saying that they have materials from a crash UFO. That's right. Uh, and yeah. he's not saying that. He said it was his opinion that that is the case. Um, and Trump said, you know, he doesn't he didn't, wasn't aware of that. He doesn't know that. Yeah. But uh, he, the reason that's know, important yeah. is because they didn't share with him a lot of information, just a very little. They probably uh, the president indicated he knew about the Navy pilots. And that's yes, probably that's what they right. told him is just what the media is covering. The media is covering these Navy pilots right. who are talking. Uh, Trump did allude to saying that he had talked to with or watched Tucker Carlson. We all know he's watching Fox News pretty much yes. all day long. Um, so he's aware of some of this stuff, but just not too terribly interested. Uh, so yeah, we'll see where this goes. Uh, one of the articles I wrote in the Roswell Daily Journal was, well, well, there's two points I I wrote. We may see another government agency from all of this. I mean, there are a lot, Mm -hmm. we have these senators that are interested. The president has been briefed. We may see another Project Blue Book. Uh, the other point is how weird it was that here we are at the Roswell, uh, festival which is usually seen as pretty silly even a year ago a year ago none of us probably would have guessed that uh, we would be here uh, while we're at this festival the president is on fox news being grilled about ufos mm-hmm. wild that's something? stuff wild yeah. wild stuff huh buddy um, just one more thing about the wreckage. I don't know. Uh, it just seems like there's a lot of uh, people talking in the UFO community about uh, community about wreckage out there lately. Um, is there any? Is there any? You know, science on this uh, do, that Not you're yet. aware of? I mean, there's an Adam project where where they're supposed to right. be yeah. uh, examining the uh, material with uh, in the TTSA, but we haven't heard from them yet. So to me, honestly, mm. uh, I think that, you know. There, the other uh, alleged things have been debunked. I don't know. We haven't seen anything yet, and uh, mm. I'm even skeptical that we will. To be completely honest, yeah, 
But now we're out of time, so thank you so much for joining us, Martin. You're very welcome. Always a pleasure. All right. I'll be right back with Ryan Bender. I am very happy to welcome to the show Brian Bender. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And this is fun. We're live in the studio, and you have your cool NASA shirt on there. Old school. I do. These these T-shirts you can buy at Old Navy that look like you've had for 30 years. <laughs> they're brand new and probably made in China. So um, I guess to start off with, uh, I, I've been following your articles for a while and was excited when Politico started doing more space stuff. And one of the things that you uh, put together was a space kind of forum. And uh, you, in the forum, you were interviewing uh, a couple of congressmen and uh, uh, someone who's on the like space committee that advises Trump that he uh, invoked when he started his presidency. And you asked them about UFOs. Why were you, I guess, prompted to do that? Well, this was back in 2018, so about a year ago, maybe a little more. And uh, it was just a couple of months after... We reported, and the New York Times reported, the existence of this Pentagon office, Pentagon program, ATIP, that was researching um, these unexplained aerial phenomenon, UAPs, as the Pentagon calls them. Uh, and we had launched our space newsletter, and this was an event where we had a couple of members of Congress who have oversight of NASA, oversight of the space program, and... I thought it was a relevant question. Um, you have Navy pilots, other military personnel who were reporting these unexplained sightings. You had a Pentagon office that was set up, or a Pentagon program. I think program is, is more of an accurate description. An office kind of makes it sound like there was some big operation, but I think it was a couple of people in the Pentagon doing UFO research at the request of Congress uh, back in the 2007, 2008 timeframe for about five or six years. And that had just come to light. And here I had sort of a captive audience, two members of Congress who have oversight of uh, the military, oversight of space programs. And so I asked them what they thought of this. And, and you know, I think the fact that they did not dodge the question, the fact that uh, this was Congressman Barra, a Democrat from California, Congressman Holtgren, a Republican, they both seem to think that this was a legitimate issue to look into. If you had reports of military personnel who were seeing things in the night sky that they couldn't explain, that were exhibiting characteristics that they hadn't seen before, maybe we should look into this more deeply. In fact, I think it was uh, Congressman Holtgren who had joked that the chairman at the time of the House Science Committee, Lamar Smith, who was getting ready to retire, should hold a hearing, a public hearing on UFOs as his you know, swan song before leaving Congress. And obviously that didn't happen. But I think uh, it demonstrates that Congress, at least some members of Congress, are interested in this issue in a way that, at least publicly, we, we haven't seen before. They take some of these reports as credible reports, and they feel that the government should do more to try and explain them if they don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Were you nervous at all asking that question? I don't think I was nervous at the time, but I mean, there's no doubt having covered the military for, I mean, I'm dating myself, but for about 25 years now, covering the Pentagon, covering military operations, um, I think I, I was a little reluctant to dive into this issue when I first got a tip about some Pentagon UFO research that had been going on. Um, as you know better than most, uh, you know, there's a stigma associated with this issue. The mainstream media has not covered it in a serious way, um, at least in, in recent decades, in any sustained way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think professionally I worried a little bit. Uh, you know, do I become the UFO guy if mm -hmm. I start writing a bunch of UFO stories? But um, I'm not so worried about that anymore because, number one, as I said, uh, members of Congress, former Pentagon officials, a whole host of, you know, credible people are talking about this, are interested in this, want to know more. 
I think the issue is, is less stigmatized than it once was. The fact that you have active duty Navy pilots willing to come forward and talk about this and not be afraid their career is going to you know, be over as a result, I think shows that, that it's an issue that's entering the more mainstream discussion. Again, I mean, it's not like, as you know, this issue is all of a sudden popped up out of nowhere. I mean, it's been discussed, hashed over by researchers, by government agencies for decades and decades. Um, but, I, but I think we have a moment here where people are paying attention, government officials are paying attention in a way that maybe they haven't before, at least publicly, you know, having a discussion that the public can be engaged in as well, and not just one that happens in secret behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. I was I was most shocked. I guess I was surprised how open they were to it. And and not only that, um, Barra, who uh, is a ranking member of, of the House Subcommittee on Space, I was surprised. He was very enthusiastic about the topic. He said he had even brought it up and said, we need to do some re more research into this. That was uh, pretty cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it demonstrates that there's also, I think, a generational shift here. I think younger people or the newer generation of, of government officials, lawmakers, are just more open-minded. I mean, mm. let's face it. I mean, there's been a lot of policies that have nothing to do with this subject, uh, whether it's, you know, the fact that gays can now serve openly in the military. Um, uh, you know, the fact that an openly gay man is running for president of the United States, is running for the Democratic nomination. I mean, we live in an era where there is broader acceptance of things that not that long ago, you know, were pretty controversial. And it's not like they're not controversial now. Of course they are. But but there's there's a willingness to be open-minded about things that uh, I think we're seeing in someone like Congressman Vera, who mm -hmm. is not just, you know, burying his head in the sand and saying, this is just kooky stuff, forget about it. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how much Congress really does take an interest in this. I mean, clearly they've been briefed about some of the research the Pentagon has done. But as far as I know, they haven't taken any action. In other words, they're not appropriating more money for research. They're not creating new programs to try and look into this. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it remains to be seen whether this will really move the ball or not. But mm. clearly there's a conversation going on that I think is new and interesting. And, and getting back to what you mentioned before about, you know, being nervous about asking a question like that in that kind of forum. Uh, um, you know, I, this is a huge story, potentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you cover the Pentagon like I do, have covered the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the defense budget, sort of the, the bureaucratic machinations that go on there. Um, if the military is puzzled about unidentified aircraft, spacecraft, undersea craft, whatever you want to call them, um, that they can't explain and they're concerned about, I mean, that's a huge story, no matter how it plays out, no mm -hmm. matter what it is, how it is, where it came from, if they're being spoofed in some high-tech spoofing operation, um, I mean, that's a huge story, too, because mm -hmm. whoever's doing it is getting the whole military up spun up over it. And so um, I think my job, the way I see it, is to continue to follow the paper trail. What is the Congress doing? What is the Pentagon doing? What can we learn publicly that's not secret, that lends maybe a little more understanding to what's going on, what these things are? Um, and, you know, if we can figure out what they are, and it's what some people have been predicting for many, many, many hundreds of years that we may be contacted by some extraterrestrials or, uh, you know, a race that lives on another planet or another galaxy. I mean, that would change the course of human history. So, like, how could you not cover this story? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we'll get more into that. But as far as covering ATIP in particular, the, the Pentagon program, uh, what can you share about how you first came across uh, that uh, it existed? Um, well, this was probably middle of 2017, I guess, uh, when I got a tip from a source 
uh, in the Pentagon that there had been an effort, I don't know if it was referred to as a program or an office, but that the Pentagon had been researching some of these unexplained sightings and that um, it had been funded by Congress. It had sort of, in fact, originated in Congress. And at the time, uh, the source was not uh, willing to say a whole lot about details, who, what, when, where, how. But obviously it intrigued me, Mm -hmm. you know, if you could prove that there was such an office or such an effort. Um, I mean, Politico covers Congress, politics, um, policy, and if this was something that Congress had sort of foisted on the Pentagon or sort of directed the Pentagon to do that, in some ways made it even more interesting for our audience. Um, And so that got me sort of starting to dig around, starting to reset, reach out to other sources, both in the government, outside the government, but also in Congress to see whether or not there was anything to this. Um, I mean, it's no secret to anybody that the To The Stars Academy folks, like Chris Mellon, uh, Tom DeLong, were sort of very active in this area and were clearly trying to get more of a conversation going, trying to get the government to do more, say more. Um, So that group of people was very helpful. Um, And then, of course, there was Lou Elizondo, who it turns out was was heavily involved in this research in the Pentagon. Uh, It sounded like he was getting frustrated that people weren't taking it seriously enough. Uh, And he was planning to get out of the government and as we now know, associate himself also with the To The Stars Academy. And so um, I'll admit at first when I heard about this, I was I was intrigued, but at the same time I was like, you know, are you serious? <laughs> the Pentagon's searching for UFOs? Like, is this real? Um, but what really convinced me, quite frankly, was, was not the To The Stars Academy's folks. I mean, obviously they were helpful they had an interest in getting this story out. They had a relationship with Mr. Elizondo. But going to the Hill and going to congressional sources and you know, figuring out that it was Harry Reid who was behind this earmark, as it was called, this $25 million or so that was set aside for this program. Um, reaching some of the congressional staff who had worked on that with him um, not everybody, in fact, most people were not at the time willing to go public about it, but they were willing to talk about it, at least convince me that there really was something to this and and that there was a paper trail that you could follow, or at least somewhat of a paper trail to prove that this office is, had existed. Um, there were other officials in who at the time were out of government but had been aware of ATIP at the time. They were helpful. Again, a lot of these sort of ex-government people did not want to talk publicly, but um, eventually I think I built up enough of a head of steam to know that this was real, that this had gone on, and that's when I kind of was ready to go officially to the Pentagon and say, hey, here's what I know, and here's why I think I know it. Tell me about ATIP. And you know, the Pentagon was not officially very you know, willing to say a whole lot, but they were at least uh, in a position to confirm that the offices, or the program had existed, that it was at the time now defunct, because we know by 2012, the money ran out. Harry Reid left the Senate. They didn't really have a sort of a, a champion for it, I guess, to keep funding it. Um, the other two senators who were crucial in, in getting that money originally put into a defense bill, uh, Daniel Inouye and Ted Stevens, had passed away, so they were gone. Um, but again, I mean, I think uh, at first I was a little bit puzzled by it all, but you know, the more you peeled back the onion, the more it became clear that this was a real program. Um, I also came to believe that it was one program, but probably just one of a number Hmm. in the government. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, this was one where you had people involved with it willing to talk about it publicly, the two the Stars Academy people, particularly Lou Elizondo. Um, clearly, Harry Reid was willing to talk about it publicly. Um, but, you know, what, what I'm thinking in my mind is there's no way if there's all these reports and all these potential sightings over the course of many years that a tip was the only thing the Pentagon was doing. I mean, in some ways, it's malpractice if that's the only thing they were doing. I just think it's the only thing in recent years that we know about because of the way it it sort of came together, the way the you know uh, there were parties involved that really did think that this should be part of a larger public conversation. And and you know, I think Mr. Elizondo probably very shrewdly in some ways plotted while he was still in the Pentagon, how he was going to get out of the government and talk about this and talk about it in a way that he wouldn't be violating his security clearance. Um, And so this was kind of a perfect storm, I think, where this this program got out uh, into the public domain, sparked a huge conversation that, you know, quite frankly, is healthy, um, in my view. But what I wonder is, what else is there mm-hmm. you know, in the military and intelligence agencies that is still going on in terms of research that we just don't know about? And you know, it'll be very difficult to get information about that, as you know, because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of it is secret or classified. So you have a lot of sources, and you were able to verify through several sources, it seems, that the, the program existed. Um, did you get a sense talking to any of uh, those sources then about these potential other programs? Um, not really. I mean, some of the sources were were, were pretty open about how, the, at least in their view, there there was more to this. In other mm. words, a, a tip was just wasn't the only thing that. Uh, you know, fits into that category of a government program or government effort to try and learn more about some of these unexplained sightings. But uh, either they didn't, these sources didn't have direct knowledge of those programs, um, or they, you know, weren't at liberty to talk about them because they were classified in a way that ATIP was not. And that's what's interesting about this ATIP effort as well. The earmark, the name of the program, you know, advanced. Aerospace Threat Intelligence Program. I think I got that right. Identification program. Identification <laughs> program. Um, you know, was kind of hiding in plain sight. Hmm. I mean, they and they did that purposely. They created this program with a sort of generic sounding name, which could just as easily be about studying Chinese, you know, hypersonic missile developments that, you know, as it could be anything else. Um, and so it was, it was, Obviously, by definition, easier to talk about um, some of the work that uh, ATIP did was was unclassified. Some of the studies, or at least some of the some of the basic sort of details of what they were looking into, what they were researching, we've seen the titles of uh, you know hosted these studies that they ordered up theoretical studies about what you know what these unexplained aircraft might be. Um, but, you know, this gets to an interesting point. You know, what else is there? And did sources talk about other programs around the government? Um, I've come to believe that one of the reasons why uh, either sources familiar with ATIP, like uh, Chris Mellon, who's come out publicly and is associated with the To the Stars Academy, Lou Elizondo, who... Um, oversaw some of this research in the Pentagon. The reason why I think they are constantly saying we need to know more, we need to do more research, we need to figure this out, is because I think whatever the government is doing in other agencies, it's very uh, decentralized and it's very siloed, if you will. In other words, if the CIA has a program that's looking into this stuff, or the Air Force does, or the Defense Intelligence Agency, or or you name it, I've come to believe over all these years of covering the Pentagon that unless you need to know this stuff, unless you are actively brought into a program, you don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think even people that have done some 
work on this issue in the government, either research or collecting data on some of these unexplained uh, sightings. I don't think a lot of them are necessarily aware of everything else the rest of the organization is doing. Um, and I think that's one of the things that would be helpful going forward. If Congress was going to do something about this, force the Pentagon to sweep up all that stuff that it might have elsewhere and put it in one place and create sort of a reporting process so that it goes to some central database or some central office that collects it because otherwise we're never going to really get a good sense of uh, we, the public, is not going to get a good sense, but even the government itself is not going to get a good sense of what it already might know. Mm -hmm. if, if there was a branch of the service or an agency that didn't want to give up their secrets and they didn't want the others to know, it, it probably would it be difficult for them then to hide it and not share it to, uh, let's say, the Congress if they were asking? It would make it harder. Um, but, you know, I'm under no illusion that there are parts of the government that might have some relevant information that doesn't want to cough it up and doesn't want to share it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of reasons why they wouldn't necessarily want to share it. I mean, one could just simply be protecting their turf, uh, which, as you know, is, is a constant game battle that goes on in the government where mm -hmm. agencies and components within agencies are always jockeying for position and, and authority and control and power. Um, but, you know, but if you had Congress mandating by law that the Department of Defense and maybe other agencies as well in the intelligence community had to uh, sweep up whatever they could on this subject, whatever data they might have, and centralize it or collate it into some, some report... Um, you know, it would be harder for these agencies to sit on what they might have or what what, what they might know. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a, a decent analogy for, for, for this kind of effort of, of getting the government to pull together what it might have in its files, um, I think is, I may get the official name wrong, but the Assassination Records Review Board, which was set up in the early 90s after the movie JFK came out and there was this public outcry. The government knows all this stuff about who killed JFK and it's hiding it, which of course the government probably didn't know all that much. But there were a vast array of agencies, the FBI, the CIA, um, the Secret Service, who all had stuff still sitting in their files that might have some bearing on could there have been a conspiracy to kill the, the president. And John Glenn, since we're talking about space, former astronaut, was in the Senate at the time. He was a key co-sponsor of the bill that created this review board uh, underneath the National Archives that was empowered to go out to all these agencies and say, give us what you got that might be relevant to this sort of list of subjects um, that we think could have bearing on, on the the murder of President Kennedy. And I think a lot of historians, a lot of experts will say that process, which took many years. I mean, I think the bill to create the Assassination Records Review Board was in 1992. It was many years before agencies uh, were able to cough up what they had. Um, obviously, there's some skepticism that everybody coughed up everything that they had. Maybe they didn't. There was resistance by the CIA to cough up some things. Um, in the latter years, but eventually even they gave in. So maybe you could create something like that for this subject of UFOs, a modern day, you know, review board that would be empowered to go to these agencies, would have security clearances, um, and could gather up what might be in all these other places. Mm -hmm. uh, and have the power to declassify some of it so that the public could see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was one of the big things that this review board did on the JFK assassination was mm -hmm. collect up whatever they could that was still sitting in these old files. And then if they were still secret, try to figure out if you could make some of that public. We're out of time for this segment, so we're going to be right back in just a minute. Fascinating conversation, especially with someone with the experience that you have. So, And we'll go over that a little bit when we come back from the break. 
But we will be right back. For those of you listening uh, on a radio station, you'll hear a commercial. Otherwise, you'll hear a short musical interlude, and you're listening to Open Mind GFO Radio. back you're listening to open mind gfo radio this is your host alejandro rojas and we're here with politico's brian bender and uh one of the the things i was thinking about what one of the difficult things would be and it, it you know we talked about this with the u2 let's say back in blue book and we even have some cia files about that how they were happy for people to think that u2s the u2 sightings were ufos um, if there's an official kind of review board, uh, you know, it kind of would make that difficult. So if like, you know, let's say the CIA went and said, well, these sightings here, you know, in California where we were testing, um, those are, are not UFOs. And they'd say, well, how do you know that? And they'd say, well, we just know. But the problem is then you've just alerted the public and, and the Russians that this particular, these sightings here are something special. They're, they're not UFOs, but they're something else. So now we've just let the Russians know, take a closer look at, at these sightings here. So, I mean, that kind of causes a difficult situation, doesn't it? Yeah, but, you know, I think it would all depend on, I mean, if Congress wanted to do something about this and it wanted to force the executive branch to gather up uh, in some comprehensive way what it knows, what it has, uh, other reports of sightings that have come across over the years. You know, it, it would be part of figuring out how do you write that law? What's included, what isn't included? I mean, you could conceive that some review board established a la the JFK assassination to look at UFOs, would carve out black programs. In other words, if it's a black program, a secret test program at, you know, Nellis Air Force Base or in the Skunk Works, that's not relevant mm -hmm. because that's a government program. It's not an unidentified flying object. It's not a, you know, something we can't explain because we have an explanation for that. So you carve that stuff out. Um, and maybe that would be one way to avoid what you're talking about. Um, and I also think a time frame would be important for this. And, you know, there's so much scar tissue and baggage going back mm -hmm. decades, whether it's Project Blue Book that the Air Force ran for 20 years that, that didn't have a ton of credibility um, uh, in the aftermath. If it's, uh, you know, um, other cases that are so old that, you know, there's, there's no... Uh, first-person testimony from them anymore, or there's no primary sources involved. Maybe you don't worry about those. I mean, maybe this is, I don't know, 1990 to now, mm -hmm. or, which I still think would be important and would move the ball because it's, number one, a relatively finite period of time that's manageable for the bureaucracy to do. I mean, if you're going to ask the CIA and the Air Force to go back to 1947 and dig up everything they know, I mean, that thing would take years. There probably would be huge gaps in, you know, mm -hmm. and there'd be a lot of things they wouldn't have any records on it at all because, you know, um, you know, people don't realize this, but, you know, the stuff that goes into the National Archives or the stuff that by law these agencies have to save is like 2 or 3% of what they generate. So I think, you know, maybe 1990, I'm just throwing that out there, but that that's, uh, you know, a significant period, you know, 1990 to 2020 is what, 30 years. And, you know, people are going to be around who wrote those reports or who saw those things in the sky and went to their commander and said, hey, what the hell is that? What should we mm -hmm. do about it? Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think to your point, I think there, you know, you'd have to sort of carefully think about how do you write this law? How, how do you, how do you mandate the government to do this, do it in a way that is manageable. 
Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So when, uh, since you had, you know, various sources to kind of vet the story to figure out that this Pentagon program existed, and you obviously were ahead of the game once this information started rolling out, New York Times article and everything, did you ever question any of the statements made by To The Stars or Luis Elizondo? Were you like, hey, that doesn't sound, you know, to jive up to, to what I had discovered? Um, I mean, I... Number one, I mean, pretty much everything that To The Stars Academy's people, and, and obviously that includes Chris Mellon, it includes Lou Elizondo, even though he had worked in the Pentagon, and some of the others. I mean, everything they told me turned out to be true. In other words, I mean, that was went a long way in convincing me that um, they were credible mm-hmm. because there were... Um, you know, there were, for example, there were documents associated with ATIP that I was able to see early on. I wasn't able to report on them um, because that was the ground rules. But as I educated myself about this program and and started to come up with ideas for how do I verify this other ways, there were documents that named other people, other offices that I was then able to sort of track down and see if what the To The Stars Academy's people were telling me panned out. And everything they told me about ATIP panned out. And so that gave me confidence. But there's no doubt I was wary of their motives. I mean, you know, what's their dog in this fight? Is it just public knowledge and, you know, understanding and we got to get to the bottom of, you know, the biggest mystery of human history? Um, Or is there some other motive? And so, you know, I was, I was... Uh, certainly aware of that. But again, what they told me panned out through other sources. Um, I think the congressional side of the reporting was key. I mean, that's where this ATIP program was born. There Mm -hmm. were people that were still up there, staffers and the like, who had direct knowledge of it, um, who were able to verify it. Um, But, you know, to this day, I, I still look at the To The Stars Academy folks as sort of one very key piece of this story, but just one piece of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and, you know, in the end, I think, as I said before, I mean, as the story goes forward, in some ways, I think it's becoming less and less about them. I mean, if the Navy, well, the Navy's issuing guidelines, they're not doing that because To The Stars Academy is telling them to do that. They're doing that because members of Congress give a shit about it and are being briefed by these pilots and saying, what are you doing about this? Mm -hmm. And so the Navy's saying, well, here's what we're doing about it. Um, And so I think the two of the Stars Academy's folks kind of lit a fire and I think it, um, they deserve credit for that. But, you know, let's face it, Tom DeLonge says some pretty kooky things. Right. I mean, uh, and I say kooky, you know, not, I mean, that sounds negative, but like, I mean, he's obviously got a vision. He's got ideas that as a reporter, I can't verify. There's no paper trail for some of that stuff. So Mm -hmm. in some ways, I, you know, I I try to try to ignore some of that and stick to what I said before. What is the government doing? What is it learning? How much of that can can we learn? Mm -hmm. Are there things we could FOIA? I think that answer is a big question because I get that a lot too. Why aren't you paying attention to what Tom DeLong says? Well, it's another opinion out there, but it's nothing substantiated. Right. And there's, you know, opinions are a dime a dozen and mm-hmm. everybody's entitled to them and some have more interesting ones than others. But like, I, I, I can't traffic an opinion. Um, right. Uh, I mean, we have people who write opinion pieces at Politico, but that's that's not my job. Mm-hmm. Um and Tom DeLong has not been invited to write one about and yeah, I don't, the as far space as I know, battles. As, right. I, as far as I know, he hasn't pitched one either. And I'm sure we would look at it if he uh-huh. pitched it. But, um, but you know, there's a difference between uh, sort of source reporting, uh, using multiple sources to verify facts, and uh, trying to unpack you know, this thicket of theories and mm-hmm. and ideas of, of what this might all mean or what this could be. That brings up another topic. One of the sources of information, of course, is the Public Affairs Office. And the Public Affairs Office at the DOD in particular has been um, kind of, I feel, uh, and you can correct me, inconsistent 
in that uh, they have kind of, uh, at times, said they couldn't verify information, essentially, that Lou Elizondo had said. Uh, at times, they said, well, we don't even think that's accurate. And later, they kind of recanted. Um, so, uh, they, does that surprise you that they've kind of had this, these all these varying answers all over the place? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, one thing I've learned covering the Department of Defense all these years is that particularly when it comes to the most sensitive issues, that by definition, if the bureaucracy talks about it, they know they can't control it. In other words, the message cannot be controlled. It's just going to spin out of control. The public affairs people are usually the last to know. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last to be empowered to say anything about it. So I also think it's important, when the Pentagon spokesperson, any spokesperson, says we can't verify that, That's a very sort of specific term of art. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's just that we can't verify it. In Mm -hmm. other words, people won't share information with me, the spokesperson, or there's no paper trail, or we can't prove it. Um, I think there's a Hollywoodized version that everybody, a lot of people, including me sometimes, has sort of internalized about the military, that they're so together and then, you know, everybody keeps track of everything and knows everything. And, and the truth is, they're just human beings like we are. And so um, it's not surprising to me that it might appear that the Pentagon has changed its story on Lou Elizondo. Um, I've come to believe that Lou Elizondo clearly was deeply involved in this program at its beginning. Um, he was one of the very few people that was approved to be involved in it. Uh, it was not his main job to cover or research UFOs. In fact, it wasn't his job at all until he was read into that program. He was a counterintelligence officer who did lots of other things over the course of his career. And I think that's where there's some nuance here to his role that, that's gotten lost a little bit. And I think the Pentagon spokespeople have kind of muddled muddled it even more, and that is ATIP is created as a budget line and a sort of a program, not an office. There wasn't an office with ATIP on the door right? where a bunch of people were working. It was a portfolio in addition to a number of other intelligence portfolios or jobs, quote unquote, that the people who were associated with it had to do. My sense is that Elizondo gets read into this, starts, you know, carrying out some of the work, interviewing people, gathering some of these testimonies. Um, And he sort of got obsessed with it because, you know, he was like, shit, I mean, this stuff is going on and, you know, we have a measly $25 million program about it. I mean, $25 million is nothing in the Pentagon. It's like the coins in the couch (laughs) that you clean out once a year. Um, And so I think he becomes obsessed with it. He takes it on, and I think when ATIP officially winds down in 2012, because the money runs out, I think he continues to operate that portfolio, continues to do some of the work, along with all the other stuff that was actually his real job. And so if you're a spokesperson now in 2019, and you got to go back and verify that Lou Elizondo, quote unquote, ran ATIP until he departed the government in 2017, you can't really do that. I mean, because there really wasn't an ATIP officially. There was no budget line. And, but what's clear to me is that he was involved in it when it did exist. And then for a number of years after that, he continued to do the research, um, kind of freelancing, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he clearly had some buy-in from his superiors to keep doing it. In other words, they didn't say, Mr. Elizondo, stop, stop doing that stuff. Uh, but it was one of a number of jobs that he had, and, and clearly one that so captured him that he's still doing it now that he's out of the government. But I think some of that background, at least to me, explains why there's this sort of confusion. Like, mm-hmm. either he was there or he wasn't there. I mean, it's not as clear-cut as, here's the office, here's the roster of the employees who work there. Here's when they started, and here's when they left. I mean, that's just not how the intelligence business works, Mm -hmm. Um, particularly a small program like ATIP. And like I said, it was very small, which makes me think it's got to be one of a number of other things the government has been doing Mm -hmm. in recent years. So uh, at least in the responses that the DOD has had, the press 
public affairs, does it indicate to you that they have been kind of uh, purposely kind of unhelpful or is it just that they just aren't in the know? They're not, that's just normal kind of day to day. I mean, it's probably, I mean, I, I, I don't know for sure. I mean, I, I know Chris Sherwood, the spokesperson mm-hmm. uh, in question, he's, you know, he's been helpful over the years on lots of other issues. Um, but, you know, he's a government functionary, like, pretty much everyone else. Mm-hmm. And he's got to operate in a specific lane. He can't just, you know, talk freely about whatever he wants to talk about. And and I think in this case, it's 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 a combination of it's difficult to verify in a way that, you know, some very confrontational reporters might want. They want it black and white. Either mm-hmm. he read it or he didn't. <laughs> Tell me. And right. it's just not that simple. Yeah. Um, and it, or I should say, it's not that simple to verify. Right. Years after, if you're the the port spokesman who you know only gets told what higher ups are willing to tell you, to then go tell the public or to mm-hmm. go tell a reporter. And you have more access because you have more sources than perhaps he even has. In that, you know, you have these sources who maybe won't go on the record, but will at least tell you something, where um, you can put together a story. Whereas Sherwood has a lot more restrictions, it would seem, than right. even you would have. And I, and I think from Sherwood's perspective, and, and again, you'd have to talk to him, but uh, this is an issue that, and I think people forget this, um, that was, this was an office or an effort, a program, a tip that was foisted on the Pentagon. The Pentagon didn't go to Congress like it does right. every year with a $730 billion budget request and say, give us a UFO research office. They never asked for it. Um, Harry Reid wanted them to do it. And so he had the power, he had the juice to get the money and get them to do it. And so this particular effort was never sort of fully owned, if you will, by the Pentagon. I don't think it's something they want to talk about willingly. I mean, it's, it's got so many minefields, if you will, in terms of public messaging. Um, probably more than virtually any other issue because mm-hmm. of the stigma, because of the distrust of how the government has handled this issue uh, for all these decades. And so the Pentagon would probably prefer to say nothing and, and, uh, and make this go away. But, you know, but a reporter is haranguing Chris Sherwood for a quote. And so he does his due diligence, you know, to his credit. He tries to figure out can I verify, can I prove that, yes, Lou Elizondo did A, B, C, and D? And he's like, I, I'm not getting anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I can't verify it. So that, that's what I think where that came from. It just mm-hmm. didn't mean that he wasn't doing it, that he was a fraud and he's a liar and none of this stuff he says about his work for ATIP is true. I just think it's not that easy for a spokesman to sort of unpack it all and figure it out. Right. And, uh, but there is a public affairs office we've heard that has been very cooperative and we've heard a lot from, uh, it's not the Air Force, we've heard very little from the Air Force or anybody else, but you broke the story about something you mentioned earlier about the Navy coming up with new UFO reporting guidelines. They've also uh, seemingly have at least given permission for these active pilots to to go on the show uh, that you're on, Unidentified, for the History Channel, and speak. So it, it seems like there's a level of cooperation with the Navy. What's the difference? What's going on there? Well, I mean, I think the Department of Defense is a huge place. And there's not just the different military services, the branches of the military, that all have their own different culture. Um but all kinds of different agencies that just operate differently. So when you say the Pentagon, you got to be specific about, well, what are you talking about in the Pentagon? Now, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, under which Elizondo worked and where some of this research went on, very different animal than the Department of the Navy, um, and is just going to deal with issues differently and be more forthcoming or less forthcoming depending on what the issue is. The Navy, in my experience, has always been much more forward-leaning when it comes to public affairs and interacting with the media and the public. Um, you know, the Navy, unlike the other branches of the military, for many years, being a public affairs officer was a real job. It was your full-time job to be a spokesperson. You were trained in it. You went to school to know how to do it. There was a real sort of culture of 
of Navy spokespeople, men and women, enlisted sailors who were in that specialty, but also officers. And so I think, I think the Navy's perspective is, you know, this is happening. These pilots are seeing this stuff. Uh, these are obviously credible people. Otherwise, we wouldn't let them fly $25 million fighter jets. Uh, we'd find something else for them to do. Congress is interested, and Congress holds the purse string. So if there's powerful members of the Senate or the House who want us to do more, we're going to do more. And then when it comes to talking to the, the media, I mean, I think they're just, their view is, let's be out in front of it. Because if we're not, and we don't talk, or we're mum, or we're no comment, it just feeds more suspicion. Well, they must be hiding something. Why are they not talking about this? So uh, I don't think the Navy, you know, on the list of things that are like anxious to talk about, UFOs is at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a different culture where, where you know, uh, this is happening. The bureaucracy is responding with these new guidelines for pilots to report these things. And so they're willing to talk about it. And, um, and I, I just think it, they're probably a little more forward-leaning than maybe the Army would be or, or, or the Air Force, which mm -hmm. is also something I've been digging into. It's like the Air Force has said very little about this. And right. If the Navy's seeing these things. Why? I mean, you would think the Air Force would want in on it. I mean, mm -hmm. why are they being left out? Um, and I, I, you know, I'm sure. But the Air Force is also a different culture. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe pilots don't feel as comfortable coming forward to talk about it. So have you made any progress with the Air Force? Uh not a ton, but um, I mean, I've made some inquiries. I've filed some FOIAs. Mm -hmm. um, How much confidence do you have in the FOIA process? I mean, it seems like that's, uh, at least from our discussions, that's the last place you go because there's there, it's not very fruitful as opposed to going to sources or even the public affairs department. Yeah, it's very, the FOIA is very frustrating. I mean, uh, number one, I think that you know, th these agencies, by definition, are created to hide things, not to reveal things. I mean, it's the national security state. And so by definition, FOIA doesn't get a lot of attention. The FOIA office is always small and undermanned. And, and you know, the, the gap between how many people they have to respond to these requests and the amount of requests is so vast that um, it's just a time suck. I mean, you, you have to be very patient if you're going to FOIA things. That's different with some agencies. Like I said, different cultures. Some agencies are, are more responsive. I found, for example, the State Department is pretty responsive. If you know what you're asking for and they can reveal it, they can release it, they'll do it within relatively few months. Um, very different, you know, if you're talking about some, some agency in the Pentagon. Um, but FOIA can be helpful if you know exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I've always advised other reporters, younger reporters who want to get more familiar with the FOIA process. Don't think of FOIA as like the be all end all. In other words, I'm going to write a letter to this agency and I'm going to ask for documents on subject A and they're going to give me a bunch of good juicy stuff. You have to combine FOIA with source reporting. You have to do the source reporting up front to know what to ask for, because the mm. more specific you can be on a set of documents, a set of memos, who wrote them, when they were written, I mean, the more specific you can be, the easier it's going to be for that bureaucrat to go find it, um, wherever it is in the agency, if it is in the agency. I like to tell this story about a colleague of mine at the New York Times, um, very good reporter, um, nationally recognized reporter, um, once had a secret document that was really juicy and he wanted to use it. Source gave it to him, but it was classified, so he couldn't use it. So he FOIA'd it and got another copy of it, of course, redacted in certain places. Um, but he was able to get it mainly because he already had it. He knew the date, he knew the name of the guy who wrote it, who he wrote it to. And so I tell that story because it's like, it's like the perfect, uh, not a very usual example, but mm -hmm. the more specific you can be, the more lucky you're going to be in Mm -hmm. or successfully you're going to be getting what you want. Which is kind of uh, ironic because at least I know one person and, uh, well, you know, there's someone, there's a, a person out there and I, I 
hesitate to mention his name. I'm going to mention his name because he's John Greenwald, who's done a lot of great work, um, but he's been critical of, of you and I uh, recently, but he's done that where he's had the actual document, FOIA is it, and they're like, we don't have it, even though he's like, I've got it right here, I'm showing it to you, a, a copy, and uh, so it, it's funny how that happens sometimes, but it may be kind of what you're going back to, they just don't have permission to release it. They don't have permission to release it, or... Maybe they can't even I mean, find it anymore. I was just going to say, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, if anybody's spent even three minutes at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, um, you you understand pretty quickly how difficult it is for these massive government agencies to just keep track of stuff mm-hmm. and keep track of it in a way that it's easily locatable 30 years later or 20 years later or even five years later. Um, but it, it also doesn't mean that that government agency that John was dealing with isn't trying to hide it either. Mm. Um, I've come across that many times where there are agencies, particularly national security agencies, that don't want to be transparent. They just mm-hmm. don't. They're, it's not in their DNA, um, especially when either one, it might reveal sources and methods. I think that is a legitimate concern. Mm-hmm. If they're a spy agency or they're a national security outfit, they don't want the enemy, quote unquote, to know how they operate. I think they overuse that excuse to sit on stuff and hide stuff. Um, and the courts uh, usually side with the national security bureaucracy mm-hmm. because there's no court judge that wants to be blamed for forcing the CIA to reveal something that then right. national security. So they, they, they totally abuse that sources and methods excuse. Like if we give you this document, our enemy will know how we gather intelligence. Mm-hmm. They'll learn something that they don't know. Um, embarrassing stuff. They hide that shit all the time. <laughs> Even if it's, Decades old. They don't want stories that show that the CIA was playing a double game, or you know, and so by law that's not a good enough excuse. I mean, the FOIA law is pretty specific. They can't withhold something because it's embarrassing. They have to have a better reason than that. But but I have no illusions that they've they've given other excuses just so they can cover up something that looks bad. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's this huge problem of just finding this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it still exists, if it wasn't destroyed, um, and not necessarily destroyed because somebody's hiding something, it's just like, it's like you do every spring, you go through your garage and you just throw stuff out. I mean, Mm -hmm. these agencies do that too. Um, I'll often, if there's a box, even though I know there might be something useful in it, I just don't want to go through it anymore. I'll throw the whole box away. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think FOIA is is a tool, but it's one tool mm-hmm. if you want to try and get. So we're running out of time, but uh, so this will be the last question: is where and you alluded to this a little bit of the possibilities of where this could all go. But do you have any sense of where it might be going? It seems like uh, you know there's a lot of talk going on uh, in Washington now. Uh, we've we had another senator just today say she was briefed on UFOs and, and kind of has a positive view. Yeah, I'd have to look up who it was. Uh, I'll do that in a minute. But um, at, at, could you see maybe an agency being created or, or maybe uh, an, uh, uh, the Navy taking this on or, like you said, uh, something more? Do you think, where is it going? And do you have any sense of that? I, I don't, it's hard to know. Um, I don't anticipate any major steps. I mean, I think if there are steps, they will be incremental ones. They will be something like, you know, when Congress doesn't really want to do anything, they always require the executive branch to send a report to Congress. (laughs) So, like, I I think that's possible, like, get the Pentagon to report back on this, Mm -hmm. uh, ideally in some public way, or at least some report that could be, could have a public summary or executive summary. Um, I don't think we're at the point where like Congress is going to hold public hearings about this. I mean, never say never. It's it's possible that one of these members of Congress who've been briefed and have taken an interest in this could, you know, get the gavel of some key committee and decide, hey, I want to have hearings on this. Um, but I don't anticipate that's happening anytime soon. Mm-hmm. As you know, there's you know a lot of other issues on their plate. And, you know, I don't know that UFOs is is at the top of it. Um, I also think, though, going forward, and I've just seen this even just in my own 
inbox or people who send me messages, encrypted messages through like different communications apps. There's people in the government that have seen these stories in the mainstream, have seen these briefings on the Hill, who know shit and want to talk about it. And, and I'm getting a sense that there's sort of this this new environment where you might see other government people come forward um, to the extent they can say something mm. that's, that's not kind of other Elizondos who's, who have information uh, that's not as classified as right as, or know. other pilots mm-hmm. um, or other personnel that have seen things. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard from some folks that I'm I'm sort of trying to vet their their claims who are government people who. Uh, attest that they 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 know of some things too that might be of interest to the public, not just in the Pentagon, other mm-hmm. government agencies, um, more and, more civilian agencies. But uh, I mean, and to that too, I mean, uh, when it comes to these sources and vetting the information, I would imagine a lot of people in the government, even some with high titles, maybe even generals, are also kind of subject to um, believing in conspiracy theories or, or things that just maybe aren't even real they just uh, have read it somewhere and they think hey this could be and and i think this is something that's going on right but i you know i think i also think the more the mainstream media covers it the more uh you know good or bad the more some of these members of congress and others will feel like they can take this on more they can talk Mm, about this more right um i keep coming back to I read about it recently. I was not aware of it, but this thing known as the Overton window, which is a theory um, that actually Elizabeth Warren, who's running for president, talks about quite a bit. Um, Overton was a professor not that long ago uh, in the 90s. Um, I think he died quite young in his 40s. But he, the Overton window that he came up with was basically the idea that there are only certain things that you can talk about in the sort of public square. Certain policies, certain ideas that are quote unquote acceptable. And that could be on education policy, it could be on anything. It's just sort of a window of what you can talk about and what you can propose. And I think she's one who thinks the Overton window is cracking, that it's widening. What is acceptable to throw out there as a policy prescription or as an idea? is just a bigger universe now. And I think a lot of the policies she's proposing on the campaign trail sort of fit into that. Like 10 years ago, nobody would ever propose any of that stuff. Uh, but she feels like she can. And I think the UFO issue is is maybe one that's also kind of in that category where the, you know the Overton window is widening and talking about this. I mean, let's face it, it's pretty cool, pretty surprising that, you know, the vice chairman of the intelligence committee in the Senate will come out and talk to a reporter and say, yeah, I got a briefing on UFOs and I think it's important to get to the bottom of this. I mean, just the fact that he's willing, comfortable enough to say that and not be ridiculed. And, you know, I'm sure he's being ridiculed. I mean, in fact, I've seen Senator Mark Warner be ridiculed on Twitter. But, um, But that I think is going to be interesting to see going forward, as you were saying, what's next. I think more stories about sightings, more reports from these credible witnesses um getting coverage and organizations like politico and you've said that you you ran it past people hey it's cool i'm covering the ufos right <laughs> and, and it seemed like they're okay and uh, the more you break well, the, stories, the deep dark secret is it drives a lot of clicks <laughs> right exactly it does i mean it people writes. are interested in this and that's not reason enough journalistically to cover it but i definitely have some buy-in that you know if we can keep following the paper trail and learn new things about what the government is learning on this issue, then that's that's newsworthy. Mm-hmm. So, and Politico is going to keep covering it, and uh, hopefully, then the competition is going to see that, and they're going to want to jump in too. Well, I think they have. I mean, it's yeah. you've seen even just some of these stories we've written, or the Times has written. ABC up brought it up place. with the president. So, and if the president doesn't believe it, then. I mean, isn't he supposed to get that briefing? As I, soon as I thought he, comes he believed in, in everything. Right, I know. And he did. Well, I mean, but that gets back to the Hollywoodized version yeah. of it. I mean, I think the government knows a lot more than they're saying, but I also think it's quite possible that people in the government who are supposed to know all that stuff don't know it mm-hmm. because they don't know where it is. Right. And, you know, the guy who knew it 
retired 20 years ago and right. never handed the file to anybody else. Uh-huh. So um, Maybe it'll pop up on eBay. But a vast conspiracy in the government to sort of hide what they know, at least in my experience, just gives them more credit than they deserve. I mean, mm-hmm. they're just not that good. And it doesn't mean that there haven't been cover-ups. It doesn't mean that they haven't hidden things. It doesn't mean that they haven't put out disinformation. But who's they? One little component of this larger organization, which doesn't talk to the rest? Uh, or is it you know, some Department of Defense-wide conspiracy? I just don't... Maybe that was possible back in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s before the internet, before globalization. That you know, There was really a tight-knit group of people all white men who could keep all that stuff secret. Maybe that's possible back then. I just don't see how it's possible now. Mm-hmm. That, um, and again, it doesn't mean there aren't pockets that are hiding things. And that's what we're trying to do is try to like shake the trees and see if we can get more out of where are these pockets. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Great discussion. It was fun. All right. We'll hopefully be able to have you back to talk some more. Sounds good. Thank you so much to Brian Bender for being on the show. He was awesome. So check him out in Politico. Like I said, he's the defense editor. He's actually the space editor as well. Uh, Of course, space being another topic close to my heart. Uh, Hopefully, he'll hire me to write an article or two. No pressure, Mr. Bender, if you're listening. But... uh, I really loved what he had to say. I think what's great about this is he's very practical, uh, pragmatic, and look, this is how I go about vetting a story. This is why, um, you know, how he gauges the veracity of one piece of information over another. There are a lot of people who have been criticizing him and other journalists, um, some of them even lumping me in with some of these guys, which I'm completely honored to be lumped in with with these group of people because uh, people like George Knapp or Brian Bender cause, or, or Leslie Kane, because I think they're excellent and some of the best in the business are best, especially covering this sort of thing. And, you know, there's, there's reasons why uh, people do what they do. And and why they uh, will, you know, there are methods to their madness. And especially when they're people that are seasoned and experienced, you know, to find out, you just have to ask. So that's what we're doing here is asking and figuring out, well, why do you take this piece of information as more important as others? So, for instance, I even got that this weekend from some of my colleagues. Well, I heard that someone at the DOD said that Lou did not work for ATIP. Mm, no, that's not really what he said. What he probably should have said is something along the lines of, according to the information I have, here's the deal. Because that's more accurate. Because as we learned from Bender, you know, uh, they just don't always have the information available to them to answer the questions being posed to them completely. And that's the situation we have. But when we have such a huge amount of uh, associated people to all of this confirming, you know, information uh, such as Elizondo's participation and, and the level of participation he had, then uh, we've got pretty, pretty strong information to support, uh, you know, his claims, which so far have all turned out to be accurate. And I hope you get a sense, too, because people have accused, oh, Brian's on the TV show, so he's going to be helping to push that. No, no. He doesn't make money off the TV show. He makes money off of Politico, and his job, of course, at Politico is much more important to him than any television show, let alone his integrity as a journalist, which is extremely important to any major journalist or, or any journalist worth their salt. So, uh, and, and I think you get a sense here that Bender is certainly worth his salt. So very honored to have him on the show. It was wonderful to hear his insights. And to me, they have been extremely helpful uh, as far as uh, helping to, to ha- keep perspective and to unpack this information and to understand everything that's going on. So, yep, thank you so much to Brian. Check him out on Politico. Otherwise, I do want to say thanks to Martin Willis for helping us out with the news at the beginning of the show. Oh, yeah, a couple things, too. 
Uh, Brian will most likely, it looks like he's willing to, and we would love him to participate in a panel at the International UFO Congress. So imagine this. Imagine this, if you will. A journalism panel with George Knapp and Brian Bender and me asking them questions. And the audience as well. You all getting to join in on this. How cool would that be? Well, that's what we're looking at doing, and you're only going to find this at the International UFO Congress. So go to ufocongress.com to sign up for that and look at some of the other speakers. So we will have George Knapp. We're going to have a lot of other really great speakers at the conference. And so check that out. A lot of stuff, too, you probably haven't heard anywhere else, and especially in today's uh, environment where this topic is becoming more serious. I think you're going to want to educate yourself on some of the cool stuff out there and some of the more interesting cases, such as I'm very excited to see this talk from Tui Snyder, these uh, late 1800 cases of mysterious airships is what they were called but some of these things uh, didn't perform like airships and these were written about in the news really really cool stuff so i'm excited for her talk among many of the other talks that will be there so check out ufocongress.com for that I also want to thank my Patreon patrons thank you so much i got to meet some of you this week uh one of you dropped one guy got mad at me. I forgot about what. Probably, uh, it probably wasn't even my fault. Whenever Elizondo says something on the TV show that people don't like, for some reason they take it out on me and they're like, You say Elizondo is true, but he said something that is total BS. I'm done with you. So then they, uh, you know, uh, get mad at me. But, uh, and recently one person who was even a patron was like, I'm out of here. So, sorry, dude, I didn't mean to make anybody mad, just trying to share information. But luckily, there are others who have joined and (laughs) do appreciate the information. I can't remember, and then this list, unfortunately, doesn't show me who the latest are, but just that this group of people are some of the latest. So, I want to say thank you to Kim and Kevin and Jamie and Mr. Physics and Ron and April and Chase and and Mark, and Corey, and Robert, and Matt, and Chris, and Dawn, and Justin, and Neil, and Jennifer, and Sandra, and Matthias, and Charlie, and Steve. Thank you all so, so very much. If you want to go become a Patreon patron, you can go do that. And I post all of my stories there. I have a story in Den of Geek actually this week also where I interviewed the director of this new Apollo documentary on National Geographic. And I also um, interviewed an astronaut, Mike Massimino. I've interviewed him before, but I got to interview him again for this piece. And I actually interviewed them together. So it was a fun conversation. And I wrote an article about it. Uh, It's mainly centered around, well, I talked with Mike, what's the difference between going to the moon and going to the ISS? Mike actually did a couple of, uh, a few trips on the, um, on the space shuttle. So that's exciting. And he gave us some really good insight there. But then we also talked about the importance of going to the moon and what it was like back then. And if you weren't alive or old enough when this all occurred, such as myself, then you are going to want to watch this documentary, Apollo Missions to the Moon on National Geographic. It just started up yesterday. It is so friggin good and here's why it's not like it was even uh, it's all completely archival footage there's no narrator um you know so it's just archival footage of everything that happened during the apollo uh program and it's just uh some of the footage uh, and material has never seen before or heard before and you you know you're hearing it from the astronauts themselves It's incredible stuff. A lot of news clips, you know, news videos, stuff like that. What's cool, too, is all of this then has been enhanced so it fits HD. And so when you're watching it, you know, it's not like the resolutions or the scale is changing throughout, which sometimes that happens. It is so good. I absolutely loved it. It was really cool. So you'll have to check this out on the National Geographic channel and check out my article 
on uh, Den of Geek. But uh, getting back to Patreon, uh, you know, I post all of my articles and everything I'm doing besides just UFO stuff on Patreon. So you can see that there. Plus, I've even promised some of you that are at the higher tier levels. As you know, I get inside information sometimes. And if I ever get inside information on actually being able to invite people to a meeting with aliens, then I'll do my best to get you like on the VAP or the, the will call list or something like that so you can join. Um, however, more realistic, there are probably other will call lists that I can get you on, such as Comic-Con's coming up. And I did this last year. I was able to get you all into some Comic Con parties. So I'll uh, keep an you know keep an eye on Patreon, and I'll let you know if stuff like that pops up. In fact, I just heard something about a Comic Con party recently, and I think I'm going to be able to get uh, a few people in there. So exciting! I know, I know. Oh yeah! Plus, I'm giving away T-shirts too. So I'll post another T-shirt to give away. Because I get all these t-shirts at these events and things I go to that are UFO and space related. And hey, you guys like UFO and space stuff. So you're going to probably like these t-shirts. But you'll find all that stuff on Patreon. You can also follow me and everything I do at AlejandroTRojas.com. That's my blog, AlejandroTRojas.com. However, if you're like, dude, I don't care about any of that other stuff. Just give me more UFOs. Then you're going to want to stay uh, pay attention to OpenMinds.tv. And in in fact, all of those UFO news story that stories that Martin and I talked about at the beginning of the show, they're all going to be at openminds.tv. So check that out. Thank you again to Caleb Hanks for the opening and close music. Thank you to Systematics for the bumper music. And finally, thank you to you all the listeners for joining me here once again. We'll have another great show next week. Until then, adios muchachos.